All right, number 21. So the functions f and g are such that um, fx equals this and gx equals a fraction. Work out f at the point 3. So you literally just replace x value of f with 3. So you're going to get f3 equal to half times, instead of x, 3 plus 3. And put in your calculator, you should get 9 over 2 or 4.5. Looks. That's it. B. State the value of x that cannot be included in any domain of g. Now, when they say domain of g, that literally talks about the values x you're allowed to use. Now, there's a common rule here. If you have a fraction or a square root, um, you can only use certain values. With a fraction, you can't divide anything by zero. With a square root, you can't take the square root of a negative number. So in terms of g, we can say, all right, the bottom half cannot be zero. So 2x minus 3 cannot be zero. So now we just have to solve this and make x a subject. So you can just plus 3 and divide by 2. So x can technically not be allowed to be 3 over 2. So every value x works except this value. So the value that we cannot include is um, x being 3 over 2. That's what we cannot include. Now finally C. Oof, this is a big one. Solve f minus 1x equals gfx. Now this f minus 1 is the inverse function of f. So firstly we look at f and we go to replace it with its inverse and equate it to gfx. So this is going to be a big marker, 6 marks, and this will take a while. So first things first, we need to work out what the inverse of f is. So let's um, rewrite it here. Yeah? So to calculate an inverse, a nice trick is to replace all the letters of y. So we have fy equals uh, half y. Instead of writing half y, I'm going to write y over 2 plus 3. And the one property of the inverse that you make it equal to x. And then you rearrange this to make, to, uh, to make y the subject. And this is easy to rearrange. You simply minus 3 and then times 2 across. So y equals x minus 3 um, oops, times, <laughs> times 2. Okay, that actually looks really bad. So to simplify that, it will just be 2x minus 6. And this is going to equal the, the f inverse function. Was 2x minus 6. Now how about for gfx? Okay, so what this tells us is that the function of f enters g. So when I say, when I say enter g, it means it replaces x value with the entire f function. So I'm going to need a bit of space for this one. Okay, so I've copied it here. So let's expand this carefully here. Yeah? So you can have 14 over. So expanding this by 2, you're going to get 2 times half x, which is x. And 2 times 3 is 6, minus 3, which is plus 3. So that's what it becomes. So that's gfx. So 14 over x plus 3. Now it tells us, solve this equation when you equate them together. So let's do it. So we're going to have 2x minus 6 equals 14 over x plus 3. And from here, let's see. The first rule is always clear the fraction. So to multiply x plus 3 across. So you're going to have 2x minus 6 times x plus 3 equals 14. Oof, this looks like it's going to be a hard quadratic. So now we're going to expand the bracket. Let me just change my pen. Okay. So we're going to do 2x times x, 2x times 3. Oh, I didn't even change it. And then minus 6 times x. And what's the last one? Minus 6 times 3. So let's times it out. So we're going to have 2x times x is 2x squared. 2x times 3 is uh, plus 6x. Minus 6 times x. Oh, actually, this is nice. Minus 6x. So they cancel out. Minus 6 times 3 is minus 18. And this equals 14. All right. Nice. So now, lastly, what we're going to do here, we're now going to just make x 2x squared a subject. So that's plus 18 across. So you're going to have uh, 2x squared equals 14 plus 18. So you get 32. And then you halfway across to make x squared a subject. You get 16. And lastly, to find x, we need to square root. So x would equal plus minus 4. Now, to check if, which x value is correct, it says here that anything about x is x positive. Nah, it doesn't say anything about x. If it doesn't tell you anything about x, then the answer is plus minus 4. If it tells you x is negative, then minus 4, x is positive, plus 4, and so on. Alright, number 22. So the diagram shows a parallelogram, L, M, N, P, where some lengths are given. And they tell us that ln equals 13.3. So that's this line across here, yeah? So I did it now. 
they want us to calculate the area of the parallelogram. Now, the one thing to note is that the area of the parallelogram is not very obvious. However, you probably see that after splitting this um, parallelogram into two identical triangles, we can work out the area of this triangle here and just double it to get the whole parallelogram. Now, to work on area of a triangle, we, there's one special formula, which is half AB sine C. And I, and I believe you get this in the front of the book anyway. Uh, where where a and b would be where sine c would be the angle between two lengths a and b now this is good for this formula here but before we even attempt this formula we need to figure out what this angle c could even be now the only way to find the angle uh, this angle here let's just call it alpha for, uh, let's just call it x for the sake of it yeah um is to use the cosine rule now to use the cosine rule you would, you can only use it if you have three lengths and an angle you're working with which is what we have to use the sine rule, you need two matching pairs of angle and lengths. So basically, we're going to use the cosine rule here. Now, the cosine rule formula is like this. It's a squared equals b squared plus c squared minus 2bc cos a. Now, you notice that we're not using these letters, but the, the key thing is, is to label this appropriately and always update it when you use the cosine rule. So, a is going to, so b and c is going to be the two that side lengths like here. So this is b and this is c. Now, capital A would be the angle, and this is the only angle we have, so it has to be here. And opposite the angle would be the little ang the little length, A. So that's it. So we know our A is 13.3, we've got our B's and C's, and we've got angle capital A. And we also have a variant formula, which is base if you want to calculate angle, which is cos A equals B squared plus C squared minus A squared over 2BC. And this is the formula I'm going to be using here reason why is because we want to find the angle so therefore we can replace everything you know we have cos x equals b squared so 7.5 squared plus 14.6 squared minus uh, a squared which is 13.3 squared over 2 times b and c okay now have a go when you do this you should get you'll get something like let's see cos x being about 0.422 dot 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 so all you want to do now is literally shift and cause inverse the answer and when you cause inverse it you'll get an angle of about 65 degrees give or take yeah and that's perfect so now we know the angle of this part we could just use um, the area of the triangle formula so half a b sine c and again the best thing to do is always relabel this yeah so in your when you're doing this by hand always redraw every single diagram so we can say that therefore the area is going to be half AB, so the, these two opposite lengths, so 7.5 times 14.6 sine C. In C, we just calculate the angle to be 65 degrees. Okay, and because we're trying to find the area of the parallelogram, we're going to just double this answer, so times it by 2. And when you do that, you should get, you should get an area of 99.2 centimeter squared and that's it all right 23 so they give us the equation m equals b minus c over a and we have three different variables all rounded cor or correct to one decimal place calculate the upper bound for the value m okay so this is just bounds and error intervals now when they say something like correct to one decimal place this means that the, the values could have been anywhere between two decimal places or more so what we do for example for part a we just set some bounds like this and it's always less than in equal to the left side or just less than some upper value so for 5.3 the value could have been anywhere before it so something like 5.25 or more because if you round that you get three or it could have been just less than 5.35 but not 35 exactly and we could do the same things for b and c so we put less than or equal less than or equal and less than and less than for the upper bit for the b bit instead of 0.6 it's going to be like something like the upper bound be 346.65 and instead of 65 will be 55 so 346.55 same thing for c instead of 80.0 it will be 80.05 and if you go back a bit it will be 79.95 again all all the same bounds here yeah? so it's just plus or minus 0 0.5 for everything yeah so plus minus 0 0.05 Okay, not bad. Now, let's actually answer this question, yeah? 
So calculate the upper bound for the value of m. So to get the upper bound when you're dividing fraction, you want to find um, the, the greatest, the, the greatest um, ratio. So m would be, so the upper bound of um, m is going to be the upper bound of the top half over the lower bound of the bottom half. The reason why, if you reduce the denominator as small as possible and increase the numerator, you're going to get a really big value. If you did it the other way around, you get a small value. If they were the same, it's like no difference because they, they cancel each other out. So in this case, to get the upper bound of b minus c, just like division, you want to find the greatest width. So to, to get the greatest width, you need the upper bound of b minus the lower bound of c, all over the lower bound of a. And that's it. And picking the correct values, the upper bound of b is this one, the lower bound of c is here, and the lower bound of a is here. And you just smash this in the calculator. So you're going to have uh, 346.65 minus 79.95 over 5.25. And therefore, you get an answer of about 50.8. Okay, not about exactly 50.8. And that's it, guys. All right, guys. Welcome to the final question of the paper. And probably the very final free H you'll ever see. It. So <laughs> let's check it out. So there are only three white and five black counters in box X, whereas in box Y you have four whites and three blacks. Okay, let's keep this in mind, yeah? Now Michael takes at random two counters from box X, so any of these two, puts them in box Y. He then takes one random counter from box Y and puts it into X. Okay, work out the probability that there is now an equal number of white counters and black counters in box Y. Oof. Okay, so this kind of question is all about counting carefully, yeah? So let's have a look. So the only, let's, let's see possible ways of getting exactly the same number of whites and blacks and why. So if you have to take two counters from here, let's say we took two blacks, yeah, and put them to here. You're now going to get five blacks and four whites. And then you can take one black back. So then you have four and four. So we can say, all right, you can say Michael could firstly do, we take two blacks first in block in box X, meaning you're going to have five and then Michael can then take one black and put it back in uh, X. So that's one that's one option. So that could be um, in terms of probabilities. So X oh yeah, X is out of 8 by the way initially. And this is out of uh, 7. So let's just do the maths here. So taking one black first, you have uh, 5 already. So 5 out of 8 times um, now you have 4 out of 7 left in box X. And in box 7, you now have technically 9. So now you have, it's kind of hard to imagine. So you've got two blacks already here. So you've got now nine, uh, five blacks and four whites. If you can take a black and put it back, you have a five out of nine chance of picking up black. So this is one example. There are more combinations, by the way, guys. And the idea is, is to work out every single combination and then work them out and then add them up the probabilities. So let's find another combo. So let's see. So, okay. So suppose we take whites now, yeah? Uh, what you could do, you could take a black and a white so now you have five whites and four blacks and you take a white back and you got four and four again so that's it so you can take uh, a black and a white making it five and four and taking a white back you could also do it in this way as well you can also take a white first and then a black and then give white back so these two are going to give you the same answers by the way yeah so these are the same so if you work one out you work the other is there any any other combinations what if you took two whites if you put two whites here, you're going to get six. Nope, no chance. So you can't choose white. So these are your, your results. Now, all you want to do is just um, put some probability values on them, yeah? So probability choosing a black first, you've got five out of eight again. And now you've got seven left. Probability choosing a white, you've got three out of um, seven. And now, if you put this in this box, you now technically have, oh, I have to count this carefully. So you've got an extra black. And an extra white now yeah so this means we now have to choose a white you got one you got five out of nine yeah remaining is that right yep and this will be the same as above now yeah now all you want to do guys is literally just um calculate these probabilities and then total them up so let's do each one yeah step by step okay so when you put this in the calculator you should get 25 out of 1 to 6 by the way guys I, I think this is correct and I haven't checked this so I would like to hear your answers for this 
and the second one below let me just change that to that four to a three uh yep and you should get 25 out of 168 and again the bottom one will also be 25 out of 168 now all you do is literally add all these up and you should get a total probability underneath and then you get a total probability of 125 over 252 which is by the way in, in terms of real in terms of decimal it's about 0 0.496 so roughly 50 percent nice you got half chance <laughs> ironically Thank you.